So before I start, I need to um, show my disclosures and my conflicts of interest. There's like thousands of people right now telling uh, the internet, telling on Twitter that I'm uh, taking money from uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so here are all my disclosures. I uh, do all the work I, you'll see online. Uh, that's all unpaid. Uh, that's completely for free. I do ask for consulting fees and occasionally I will do some consulting for like particular uh, science integrity cases for, uh, for universities or publishers. I um, will occasionally get speakers honoraria, but it's really not a lot. And um, I do have a Patreon account. And so I, um, you can support me there. And I, uh, my name is on a couple of uh, Ubiome patents. And I don't know if you heard the news, uh, but the Ubiome co-founders are currently charged uh, by the FBI um, and, and, and for, you know, fraud defrauding um, the US government. And so I don't yeah. think my patents are worth a lot, but I mean, I <laughs> there you have it. Or... Uh, uh, not really. Can people, I'm um, gonna have to mute, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, and so I also wanna acknowledge a lot of people. So the work I'm doing um, as sort of as a whistleblower, I guess, I'm not standing there alone. I'm standing on the shoulders of many other giants who uh, who do this work or who has done it before me and who sort of paved the way and, and um, uh, showing me how to do it and how to do it right. So there's many people, some of uh, whom are present here and some of whom are anonymous uh, for whatever reason, for good reasons usually, but there's many other people. Lisa, sorry, I, I think I, I accidentally removed your shares, screen share, if, if not. Oh, okay, I didn't. Sorry about that. Notice that, but let's see. Um, do I need to share again? I guess. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry. There you go. Okay, so great. Oh, we'll see okay. it. I Thank you. It. I had no idea. <laughs> Um, so I want to acknowledge a lot of people who uh, are doing this and, and their, their names are all here. There's, there's some others I uh, didn't put on there. They either are doing similar work to what I'm doing or they're providing the infrastructure that I'm using, um, like Papier, for example, um, to, to post these comments. Um, my cursor in the right field, okay. So how did I start my work? So uh, I started with working on plagiarism. I heard in a podcast somewhere that some papers, some scientific papers had plagiarized text. And I was just uh, intrigued by that. And I thought, oh, let's see if somebody plagiarized my text. So I, I just put a couple of sentences from a review paper that I had written into Google Scholar between quotes. And sure enough, not only did I find my own paper, but another paper that had used my exact sentence. I think if that day I did, I would have picked a different sentence, my career would have ended really differently <laughs> because I was so mad that somebody had taken my sentence and used that in, um, it, was, it was a predatory publisher, but nonetheless, I was angry. And um, I, I, I took that, I look at that paper and it turned out that they had used a lot of different sentences, not just from my paper, <clears throat> but from many other papers. And so one thing led to another, one um, plagiarized paper led me to many others. And so I kept on searching. And at some point I found about 80, uh, mostly review papers that had used text. And this was mostly in the microbiome, immunology, probiotics field, sort of, sort of my own field. Um, and I reported all these 80 review papers um, to the journals and, and was actually quite successful in uh, getting uh, some of those retracted. So um, 35 of those have been retracted, and, um, but 34 still are out there and have not been addressed. Um, so I, I mainly used Google Scholar for these searches. Um, Authenticate, which is of course the, the sort of the leading authority in plagiarism detection, that's too expensive for a private person to use, like you would uh, need to pay an X amount of dollars per paper that you scan. And I was scanning thousands of papers. I would not have been able to afford that. And they would also not give me a license. I just asked for it and they said, no, you have to pay us full time. So I was pretty angry about, about that. But um, I did use Syntaxer a lot, which is developed by uh, Deborah Weber-Wolf. Um, and uh, that was very useful for me to compare 
one suspect text to another source text. And uh, you can see on the bottom left how that marks the, the, the two, um, the source and the, the plagiarized text uh, document. So you have a suspect text and a source text and you can compare them and it will um, highlight in colors uh, which, uh, which of these um, texts are identical. It wasn't, uh, it, it, it was perfect for what I was uh, looking for, but the way I was I was marking my documents is a little bit different. So this is already my my wish list. I I wish there was a syntax for multiple sources because the the papers I was working on usually had like up to twenty or forty even different sources, and so I marked them differently. Um, where syntaxer marks the documents for um, like it switches to a new color as soon as there's a break in the in the identity. I uh, marked them by hand. So I did this all by hand by going to Google Scholar and marking all these documents. And so in my document on, shown on the right, you can see the sources highlighted for, for um, yeah, each source has a, its own different color. And so you can see that some of these papers have um, many different sources and they sort of switch from one paragraph to another. So that is what I, I was doing for about a year, sort of in my free time, I was still working full time at Stanford. And I came across a PhD thesis um, that had plagiarized text. And I um, it, it was just flipping through the images. And I noticed that um, in figure 2B in a particular chapter uh, and figure 3D from another ch chapter and figure 6D from that same other chapter. So basically two chapters, there were three figures. But I noticed this little, um, little dot uh, that was above one of the bands in a Western blot. And I've marked this here. This is actually the way I originally marked it and reported it. So it's, I would have chosen a slightly brighter color now, but I just wanted to show you the original um, finding that I did. Um, I, I found that this blot was used three times to, and each time it represented a different experiment. And it was, I thought super easy to recognize. And you can also notice that in the bottom figure, it was um, in mirror image. So it seemed to be either cut differently or used in a, a mirrored image um, uh, view, uh, but it's the same blot. It's very recognizable, this little dot. So I'm like, well, everybody should have seen this. Come on, mm. I, I can see this and I wanna, uh, so I reported these, these two papers and they got retracted. It took about a year and that same evening when I uh, when I discovered this, I thought, oh, I guess I, I can see these duplications and, and if they're in published papers and well, probably this is just, you know, a one time finding. But but so I went to uh, I went online, I searched for papers and I found that same evening I already found a couple of other of these duplications. And so my new career, my new hobby was born and I switched from plagiarism to searching for these duplicated images. And um, why do I care about images? Because images in scientific paper are, are, are the data. They're, they're just the proof of a particular outcome of an experiment. And also because um, like as humans, we're very visual. And so images tell stories to us um, and, and, and serve as proof. You, know, you, have to, you have to see it to believe it. So if we see something, we tend to believe it. And, but it's very easy to manipulate what the eye sees. See, so um, these six photos here that you see are all completely photoshopped. They're they're fake, but they're they're supposed to tell a story. So they might show that a president is very dumb because he's holding his book upside down, uh, as you can see in the top middle. But the the photoshopped it that's a photoshop. Like the he, the real photo is not holding the book upside down. Or you might believe that the National Geographic team was was. Um, followed and threatened by a bear, but they actually completely, this is a, a fake photo of the bear has been photoshopped in. Um, the tsunami is also not real. Uh, the, um, so there, all these photos have a Photoshop, but it's, I cannot recognize them as a Photoshop. I, I could see, well, that looks like a very, um, you know, remarkable situation, but I cannot recognize a Photoshop. But what I can recognize are duplications. So there's two of these photos here in this um, little collage that have photoshopped, that have duplicated elements. And so that is what I recognize. I don't recognize the Photoshop, I recognize duplication. So on the top left, you see a missile launch in um, uh, Iran and it has duplicated elements. There were th uh, only three of the four missiles 
successfully worked. And the fourth one was uh, photoshopped with elements from one of the other uh, successful launches. And on the right, it's a North Korean Hoover craft um, landing on a beach, but um, there seems to be a couple of elements that are repeated, maybe to make it look more impressive, things like that. So I don't recognize photoshops, I recognize duplication. So that is what I'm looking for in uh, during my scans. And so if you see a bathroom, if I see a bathroom like this, I don't know if you can see it, but this is this, this would drive me completely nuts because all I see are repetitive patterns in the tiles. And I realized I've always seen those repetitive uh, patterns and I thought everybody else sees them, but I guess maybe I'm a little bit unique in that. Um, but I once I point them out to others, they start to see it too. So I think it's one of those things that you just have to, have, somebody has to point it out to you and then you start to, um, to notice it. Um, so, but of course photos, um, I'm, I'm not really using my talents for um, bathroom tiles. I'm trying to use them for things like these, <clears throat> excuse me. So I was notified by a very frustrated reader that uh, he had found this photo, this, this what he believed, what he claims was a Photoshop in a scientific paper. So on the left, you can see um, a patient who was treated with a laser treatment uh, before, that was before the treatment. And on the right, you see the same patient three months after a magical laser treatment uh, and the treatment um, supposedly removed brown spots from the face of the, the patient. So this was before and after treatment. And, and this reader came to me and he said, I'm, I'm trying to get this paper retracted because it's the same photo. It's the same, it's not only the same guy, it's the same photo. They just photoshopped the, either the brown spots in or the brown spots out, but it's the exact same photo. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, yeah, of course this is the same photo. He's wearing the same shirt and like all the hairs in his face are exactly the same. And even though the cutout is a little bit different and the little bars on his eyes are different, um, these are the same photos. And if you put them next to each other and you have stereoscopic uh, view, you can actually um, make the, the brown spots float. And it's very easy to see that's the same photo. So I wrote to the editor and he's still like, no, no, you have to prove it. And I'm like, dude, look at the photo. This is the same, the same photo. And so this made me realize like, uh, you know, if I see it, that doesn't automatically mean that other people see it or believe it. I need to have um, some, some tool to, to prove it that, that, that these photos are the same. And it's, it's very hard for me sometimes to convince others that what I see is, um, you know, is a duplication. And so um, in the end, uh, you know, I, I did some, some other analysis and I convinced the editor that this was the same photo. And even though the authors kept on denying that, uh, he said they, they were saying no that the guy was wearing the same shirt, you know, three months later, and they kept on denying it. But in the end, the, the paper did get retracted. Um, and of course, most photos in scientific papers are not photos of faces, they're, they're photos like these. And these are the photos I'm spending most of my time on. And all of these photos are perfectly fine. There's no, there's no duplication in them, but they're here to show you that in, in in biology or in science in general, photos tend to be pretty unique. Like Western blood bands all have different shapes and, and sizes and, and uh, different versions of gray. And I can tell all of these apart. They're all unique, they're all fine. And um, similarly, tissues and cells all look different and unique. And, and you can, they, they're similar to each other, but they're all unique. And so all these images are fine and there's nothing wrong with them. But I'm of course specializing in images that are duplicated. So here are a couple of examples of duplicated images that I found during my searches. And, and they're also here to represent the three different categories of photos that we that I started to sort of um, put them in into different bins. So if we start on the top left, you'll see a, a bunch of different panels there, are, uh, I believe bacteria streaked on, on agar plates. Um, these are different bacterial mutants, there are different treatments. Basically, there's a bunch of panels that all should look unique. They're all different experiments, but they all look similar, of course. But if you stare at this long enough, you can see that there's two sets of panels marked by me in red or blue, and those panels look identical to each other. And so I've marked them and um, said, you know, wrote to the editor, like, these are unexpectedly similar to each other. But this is what I call a simple duplication. It's the exact same photo used to represent different experiments, 
but there's no there's no change. It's the exact same view, the exact same cutout. So I call this a simple duplication. On the right of my slide, I have two examples on the top and on the bottom of what I call repositioned duplications. So these are duplications where there's um, it, there's an overlap basically. There's um, but the, the the sample has been moved under the microscope. There's a little zoom in or zoom out, or there's even a rotation. Um, uh, so you can see the, the the four panels on the top right. These are cells for different uh, experiments of cells treated with different amount of radiation, and um, but you can see that that uh, there's actually two sets of overlaps. So instead of looking at four photos, we're only probably looking at two photos. And on the bottom right, you can see an example of um, Western blots um, and marked by me with red boxes. They're shifted two lanes to the right, and they're used to represent two different proteins and two different cellular locations. Now, this could still be an honest error. You could argue that somebody was very sloppy in keeping track of their Western blots or their photos, but it could still be an honest error in some way. But then if we move on to the bottom left of my uh, slide, you'll see um, four different Western blots again and um, five different experiments. And you can see that in uh, panel A, uh, lane one and three, marked by me with blue boxes, are they look identical. While in panel D, there's three lanes that look identical. So here we're seeing a duplication within the same photo, which is, in my opinion, very unlikely to ex be explained by an honest error. So I call this a duplication with an alteration, usually a duplication of a feature within the same photo. Maybe the same cell is visible twice or three times. And, and those are the least likely to have been done by an honest error. So categorizing these images into all these different categories helps me uh, answer the, you know, the question, the all important question, how many papers, what's the percentage of papers that have um, misconduct? Because it, it is still hard to say for an individual case if something is an honest error or done intentionally, but if it falls in category one or three, it's fairly clear what it might be, but category two could be either way. So it's sort of, um, yeah. Uh, I guess, but it but it's helpful because I started to turn this uh, hobby project into a real scientific project, and I could only do so because I um, asked Arturo uh, Casadevall and Farrick Fang to become sort of my uh, partners in crime in this in this um, project, and they were incredibly helpful in uh, setting this up and um, listening to me. I had to talk a lot to them and show them a lot of examples before they start to see it because in, at first they did not believe it because I actually uh, tried to convince them with some examples from their own journals. They're both editors-in-chief of MBio and of infection and immunity and I, um, I showed them some examples and they did not believe me and, and, and actually got a little bit angry but in the end I got, could convince them that these examples were real and then they were on board and um, the three of us published this paper. So what we did is I basically scanned the papers. I scanned 20,000 papers from 40 different journals, 14 different publishers, and they then had to agree with my findings. So I found about 4% of these papers to have duplicated images. And uh, if they did not agree with me, they, then we, I took them out of the, the set. So that's, that's the best we could do sort of to ensure that it was not just me seeing these things, but at least two other experienced editors-in-chief had seen them as well and agreed with me. So we found uh, 782 papers in this, um, in this set of 20,000 that had duplicated images. I only scanned papers that had at least one photo. If they didn't have a photo, then uh, they weren't included in the 20,000 papers. Um, so that meant I actually enriched for these um, type of papers by searching for the term Western blot. So that was my search term to enrich for papers that have photographic images. But even if they didn't have an image of a Western blot, they usually would have images of, of um, uh, microscopy or tissues or, or other kinds of photos. So all of those were included. And like I said, I had these three categories, simple, repositioned, and altered. And we found that these 782 papers were roughly equally distributed over these three types of duplications. And um, because we, we sort of, um, stated that the simple duplications are the most likely to be done by an honest error and the altered ones, the, the, the Photoshop ones are the least likely, we sort of made an educated guess that about half of these papers, so that's 2% of all the papers I, I'd screened, 
had intentionally um, uh, intentionally done duplicated images. And of course, it's much harder for me to for or for anybody to detect a an alteration or a manipulation or a duplication of data in in things like tables or line graphs. So th those are pretty they're very easy to cheat in. And I only uh, look at photographic images, so it's it's a very skewed view. But I think it's it's a it's a it's a step forward in knowing uh, what the duplications are. Again, I scanned all of these papers by eye, so I did not use any software for this. So some some graphs that I made because we had now a nice little data set to to look at uh, things like impact factor. So on the left you can see the relation between the impact factor of the journal. We had forty different journals for fourteen from fourteen different publishers, and of course I knew the percentage of papers that I found in these papers. I have to say that most of the papers, about half of the papers of these twenty thousand, were from plus one because this is how, how I started my search. And I then later added the other paper. So it's it's heavily skewed towards plus. Those, those are the there I have the most data points for. But um, you can sort of see there's an inverse relationship between um, between problems and impact factor. So on the top uh, on the on the bottom right here you can see the signs and the nature, which I also scanned, and they're not free of these these problems. But uh, you can also see that some, some journals with, with low impact factor score really poorly. They have like high percentage of, of papers with problematic images, and then most notably Spandiros journals. But there's some journals with low impact factor. Here's some Wiley journals that do really, really well. And um, so there's, it's not only impact factor, there's probably also big influence from things like an editor or the types of, the types of papers or the types of people who send in papers to, to journals. So it's somewhat inversely related but highly correlated to probably to the to the editor and on the right are the data points this, these are just the plus one papers because it's very easy to sc screen for affiliations in plus one so there i uh, compared the fraction of published papers and you can see that most papers in plus one um uh, so that's just the published papers uh, so about you know 30 40 50 percent of papers um uh, or well, almost 80% of papers are published together by China and, and um, USA affiliations. But if you look at the fraction of papers with problematic images, with duplications, then you can see that um, China has a little bit more papers than expected and the US, a lower ratio of expected. You can see there's a correlation between uh, somewhat between country and, um, and problems. And that is not because of, you know, People in China are more likely to uh, Photoshop because they're they're bad. It's because of incentive structures. So we did also some research on that and showed that there was a good correlation with the academic incentive structure in a country versus um, uh, versus problems. Um, and that has to do with you know if you publish a paper in China, you might actually get a monetary award like uh, a car or um, a business uh, flight, uh, a business class flight ticket things like that. And so people are more incentivized to, to write papers um, and, and, and thus to, to cheat. So um, I have a little, I usually put in a couple of puzzles. So I played a game on, on a Twitter called with the hashtag image forensics in which I usually remove most of the, the labels. So here you can test if you are a super spotter and you're not allowed to use any software. Um, I'm not gonna leave it up to too long, but um, you know, just just see if, if if you can spot at least one duplication. There's many duplications here to find, and um, I don't see them immediately. So what I do is when I look at an image like this, I will sort of notice that all the colors are very similar and like the the the, the distribution of cells. And so I'm like already suspicious, like there might be something here. So I'll start staring at it. And it's not that these duplications immediately jump out as, at me. I might spend up to half an hour or an hour on an image like this trying to find them if I do it by, by eye. And so here's um, what I found. So here are the duplications that I've marked. And you know, if you, if you get it right on Twitter, you can even get a little award, emoji award. And so people love that. So I, I played this, I, I play it as a game, but of course it has a very serious undertone. This might be scientific misconduct. So I try to be respectful of that uh, and not you know, make fun of people. But just to, to show these, these um, challenges to make people more aware that these things might exist. So you see there's lots of overlap. I, I, I marked them with these colored boxes. 
And this was a paper in PLOS One. And I reported it in uh, 2015, and it finally got a retracted in uh, March 2019. It was cited by 27 people. Um, I don't know, I did, that seems like a long time for me to, uh, you know, between reporting and retracting, but, but here it is. And I think this is a good decision because if there was one or two overlaps, I would say, sure, that could be an honest error, but my rule is three strikes and you're out. So I see more than three different colors here. So that's, in my opinion, um, that should be, uh, you know, that's so sloppy that you, it, it's hard to then uh, trust the, the, the rest of the data and the paper. But I also, I'm starting to use now uh, software. So I've shared my data set with many people. And um, uh, Marcus Leiblinger in um, the university in Vienna, in Austria, has uh, developed a free software tool called Image Twin. Uh, it's still in beta, so you need to have a, an, an account. But this is the first software, basically, that I'm using regularly. And this is what the software found. And if you, um, if you, if you focus on these yellow and orange boxes, those were the ones I did not find. All the other ones I found myself. I'll go back one slide. This is what I found. And this is what the software found. So it does a really good job. It's, I'm, I'm actually starting to be convinced that computers could be better than humans because I would have totally missed this little, little sliver here. And um, yeah, so it found two extra overlaps. Basically all these four are the same. And um, yeah, so, so by then the paper had already been retracted, but I think that confirmed that, that you know, basically what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm marking these things correctly, um, but the software is able to find more of them. So here's another little challenge for you to look at. See if you can spot a duplication. These are, I believe, they're, they're protein blots, uh, either Comasi stained or Western blots. I've posted this one on Twitter, so you might already know it. So I'm not gonna spend too much time, but here's how I mark them. So you can see these two lanes here appear to be the same as these two lanes. Uh, there's a little recognizable scratch here, and you can also see it comes back in a different figure uh, another time. This is a science paper, folks. This is not, this is a very high impact factor. It was cited 830 times, and I reported it in April, 2015 and nothing happened. This is, this is embarrassing. I, I believe this paper should be retracted. Um, of course, that's my personal opinion, but um, yeah, I, I'm disappointed that this paper is still out there. I'm also worried, like this is a paper by US authors. Um, the previous papers was by Chinese authors. I do feel that, um, you know, a certain population of uh, well-known um, U.S. scientists are seem to be protected to be, uh, you know, their papers are not retracted, and um, that's a shame. I feel so. Uh, it happens in any paper, and it can be found, and it's very dependent on how the editors will respond to these things. So. I've reported my 782 papers, all of them. I've reported in around 2014 and 15, um, uh, some in 16. So uh, we're five, six years later now. And that gives me a good, a good data set of, of almost 800 papers to know what happens when you report these papers. So all of them are reported to the editors. I didn't report back then on, uh, on pop papier so much. Uh, and not all of them are yet on papier, but all of them were reported to the editors in chief of the journals. And so what happens five, six years later? So if you look at the complete data set of all 800 papers, about 60% of them have not been touched. Um, and there's a, you know, a, a bunch of them are corrected here in, in yellow. And then there's a little sliver of expression of concern in orange. And um, about 10% of them have been retracted. If you split it out into the different categories of, um, you know, like the, the simple duplications, the repositioned here in the third bar and the, in the fourth bar category four, the altered one, the Photoshop one, you would hope to see that the Photoshop one have a higher chance of retraction. And they have, like they, there's a definitely seems to be a correlation between the type of error and whether or not the paper gets corrected. But unfortunately, the category three also has the most uh, not touched papers. And this might, this might be that an editor just doesn't know what to do, or maybe the, the authors don't respond. I, I don't know yet, but this is a good data set to sort of show you 
the amount of inaction that there is in scientific publishing, where 60% of papers have not been touched, even after me patiently waiting for four, four five, six years. And um, yeah, I, 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 I really hope that computational tools will, will allow both um, journals to, to, to uh, investigate these things a little bit more quicker and, and have people believe me that these are, are uh, most of these are, are real concerns. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I've also worked on uh, tadpole paper mill. So we, we heard about that yes, yesterday. Um, and um, this, is a, this is another big problem. And so uh, these are two papers that you see here, both belonging to what we call the tadpole paper mill. And Jennifer Byrne yesterday uh, talked about that. And um, we found this in a very different way. Um, so this is work I didn't do just by myself. Um, a person under the pseudonym called Morty found these first, and uh, they noticed that uh, there were these very similar looking Western blots in, in very different papers. Um, the papers had similar title structures, but they were about different um, miRNAs and different cancers and different patient sets. But the, the, the Western blots look very similar. And if you zoom in on these two, two different um, Western blots, you can see that um, these, these blots have um, very similar structures. So not only are they very, they only look very similar across the panels or the, the figures within one paper, they also look very similar across papers. And if you, if you enhance the background, you can actually see that the background of these panels is always the same. And I recognize it because there seems to be a sort of a vertical slide, vertical little um, sliver here that is also present in here. And, and here you can see that the, like if you really look at pixels, these images are not exactly the same. You have to squint through your eyes and then you can see they have the exact same background. And, and so it appears to, um, these, these images have appeared to have been artificially generated. I believe these might be completely fake Western blots. Maybe they have like a computerized way of assembling these different bands. But um, whoever made these images made uh, an error, like they, they use the same background. This is how we recognize them. Of course, now we're telling the bad guys that they should switch their background a little bit more because now we cannot recognize it anymore. But um, this is, as I believe, a real threat to scientific publishing. This is not just one person trying to uh, squeeze in a couple of Photoshop in, um, in, in a paper here and there. There are thousands and thousands of papers that are um, being uh, published and, and editors fall for it because these individual papers are not recognizable. They look different and they're, they're, the text is different, but they're based all on the same template and they're rewritten over and over again. A different cancer is squeezed in, a different pa patient set and a different, um, yeah, some different proteins and, and it looks like a completely different paper. These are, we believe, all fake papers and they're um, a threat for scientific publishing. And very hard to recognize. So that's where we definitely need help because these are computer generated. And so hopefully we can also use computers to, to recognize these types of images. Here's another example. This is a different set of papers. I call this the stock photo paper mill. And I worked on this myself. Um, and so here are two different papers next to each other. And it's hard to recognize that these are all from the same uh, probably the same studio, the same paper mill that made these images because they, they sort of look different. They're both retracted by now. But if you zoom in, you really have to remember, uh, have a, a way of remembering these images. So this image is the same as that. And here's an enlargement in the next slide. You can see these two images next to each other. And uh, if you focus on this, this structure here in the, in the red box, you can see there's a little T-shaped, or I call this the hammer, so I, I gave little funny names to these images. So this image, this photo is called the hammer and here you can see it zoomed in um, and it has this T shape and here it's upside down and like it's rotated uh, 180 degrees, but it's the same photo and here you can see that same structure. So they really try to put some effort, but they're re reusing the same photos. Uh, so that's why I call this stock photo paper mill and had about 125 papers. And the, they were mostly published in the same journal which is remarkable because you would have thought that at some point the editors would start to see that these are all the same photos, but they didn't, but we pointed them out. And, and so they're, the journal is starting to uh, retract these. Uh, here's another problem. There's another um, paper mill. 
I call this the comb paper mill. And um, there's four different, these are four different plots from four different papers, um, but it, it appears to be all the same plots. So this is where I really hope we, we there could be software to detect these things because I, I sort of see them that these, you know, I just look at these by eye, but uh, some other people might make overlays, but it's very uh, time consuming to, to prove that these are the same uh, same plots. Um, but yeah, they remove some data points, add some other ones, have a different R value, and there you have a new paper. Um, but these, we believe these are all completely fake data points. So uh, what did I learn after seven years or so of, of reporting? Um, so I've reported by now 4,800 papers. I have a couple more that I never reported, um, but um, these are all reported either to the editors or the institutions or to Papier, and of course there's an overlap. So not all of these have yet been published to the, to the um, uh, editors yet, but the, those are the ones I've reported sort of publicly. Um, well, for me, it helped to, to, to know what not to do. And, and so I tried to remain objective. I tried to, I've always written under my full name, although on Papier I've used some pseudonyms, but writing to the editors, I've always used my full name. Uh, I have tried to build up a reputation of um, only marking the things I'm very certain of. I've made some mistakes in the past, but it's luckily not too many because of course, since I'm you know, on Twitter, like people will point out any mistake I'll make. So I have to be very certain and I don't post everything I see uh, because I don't really make, ha think I have a very good case. Uh, what I've also learned that it's, it's for me, almost the most work is to contact the, the editors or the publishers because it's so hard to find sometimes the editors in chief. And of course, if I, if I find a lot of papers, there might be papers from all different kinds of uh, editors. So if I have fifth, found a set of 50 papers that might be published in 30 different journals and I have to hunt down 30 different um, contact addresses and then write to them and then half of the email addresses already bounce or or maybe the some journals don't always share their the names of the editors um, uh, it, and, and don't have contacts so I need to hunt down where these people are and if it's you know, uh, uh, Jay Jones in New York, I don't really have much to work with. And so I, I cannot find these people. And it seems that, you know, most publishers, uh, of course, are starting to, <laughs> to be approachable, but there's just some, some journals that make it um, seem to be very hard to, to contact them. The responses of journals and, and institutions is also very variable. Uh, like sometimes I'll get a thank you, we've received your email and we'll, we'll take care of that. And then I don't hear anything for two years. I've also had lack of responses and notably I will call out ORI because I've reported uh, dozens of cases and I, I never got an answer, not even a, we got your email. And, and that is frustrating because, you know, some of these papers are NIH funded and I believe the least that ORI can do is send me an email that they got my email, but even that seemed to be not possible. And, so I am quite frustrated as the person on the other side, it feels like I'm tossing things over the wall and nothing happens. I know we've heard yesterday that there's a, you know, in, behind the scenes, there are people working on these cases, but it is as a, as a person who reports these things, frustrating to not hear anything for five years. And then I have to call back. Like it seems that the COPE guidelines are not often followed and in many cases, I don't even hear if a paper gets retracted, but I get a phone call from uh, Retraction Watch saying, oh, this paper got retracted and we believe it's yours. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know it was retracted because the journal never wrote me. I will say that PLOS One is doing an amazing job. Of course, I dumped a lot of papers in their lab, but they're, they're very good in keeping me posted on the, on the progress of these papers. So I do wanna give a, a shout out and kudos to PLOS One of, um, working uh, you know, really hard on these cases and making progress. So with these frustrations, I do think that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sort of driven to take things more in the open and I'm using Papier and Twitter to, to call out these papers. And I feel the least I can do, I don't wanna have a paper that it takes five years to, to get it retracted. I wanna immediately flag them for, for people and to see that there's a possible concern about these papers. So I'm sort of currently seeing it more my priority to post things on papier than I see it to report it to the journals. 
Uh, but yeah, I've called out some, some big cases. So the science paper I showed you earlier on the left. And uh, this is a, in the middle, an, a paper that I found in Nature um, that I called out actually almost first on, on Papier and um, that got retracted. So all these, um, these things are, are out there in the open. And so uh, I'm using a little bit of um, image forensics tools. Um, so I have a data set of, these are all plus one papers. So they're very comparable in, in terms of format and, and um, uh, image structure. Um, it's the, call, the set that I call the 350 dirty and 700 matched clean papers. And I've shared that with many um, image forensics uh, folks who are developing um, tools. But it is also frustrating that I have not had access to these tools. The tools that I feel I've helped develop, like why can I not have access? And I know there's legal stuff, and, but it, it would be really nice for me to, to test these things. So I've only had access to Forensicoli, Image Twin, and Sherlock. So Sherlock is a uh, developed um, by Guido Bartoli and is available on GitHub. Image Twin is um, in beta, so it's 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 online and it's very easy for me. It's you know you drag your screenshots online and it it finds the duplications. Forensicoli um, um, is very good in finding direct repeats. So the image that I sort of started with with the the, the laser treatment before and after. This is how Image Twin would mark the, you know, in colored boxes, the different regions that it found similar. Forensically marks it differently, draws these, so actually makes it very hard to see what is the underlying picture because it found so many of these duplications. Um, both are really good for this particular image, but forensically could not, cannot detect any rotations or mirroring or so. It needs to be exact copy. And so Sherlock, um, uh, works, I think, really well. I have a very, hopefully, hilarious thread because I tried to install it because it's on GitHub. And like, I have, I have not a good way of, you know, knowing what to do. You really need to be fluent in Python to, to, to be able to install it. So I have a very long Twitter thread. You can see a little uh, thing where I tried to install it and my husband had to help me like 20 times. And, and even he got like, well, he even, even he said, well, these instructions, you know, they might work for the developer, but they're not going to work for anybody else. That's way too hard for me. That's like, I cannot install that unless you follow like, you know, Python for uh, advanced people. Like that's, um, that's just too complicated. And so I have it, I think now installed on my computer. I completely forgot how to start it up. It's something with the terminal. It's like, like, I, I don't know, I need to change directories. And I, I, I forgot the instructions, so I cannot use it. Uh, it took me like, you know, a day to install it and I'm not even using it. So that's that's not the type of software I'm looking for. I'm looking for a drag and drop or like something easy that I, I, I can just focus on other things. So with that, my last slide, these are my wish list of things I, I would love to, to have. Obviously an image duplication detector. Um, and you know, you can pick me as a beta tester. I'm not as nasty as, I, <laughs> as a lot of people think. I'm actually quite nice, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, I have some experience in, in, in how, you know, the software should work and, 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 and of course, what types of images it should find. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm looking at uh, Debbie a little bit, but like, I'm hoping for some software that can find text textual similarities. So not just really like plagiarized text, but for multiple sources, but also like, I feel that all these um, paper mill papers are very similar in text, like the textual structure, like do they have one sentence even in common? And it's very hard if I have five PDFs to, to scan them because I have to do sort of a pairwise comparison. I cannot really find which, which phrases they have in common. And that sounds like a very easy to solve problem, but I, I don't know, but I, I would love something like that. And then things like plots, like the plots I showed you, can we, can we, could there be software that helps me in detecting that these things are indeed the same? And then some easier way of reporting. Ideally, I would love Papier to just completely integrate with, with uh, publishers and, and journals so that if I post something on Papier, I've reported it. Like I don't have to worry about uh, the publisher not seeing it. Like that's already an immediate automatic email to the publisher. So I don't have to spend hours and hours trying to hunt down uh, people's contact addresses uh, and things like that. And if you like any of that, uh, if, you, if you are into a manual detection of these things, you can play the game Image Forensics on, on, with me on, on Twitter. 
And with that, I will stop sharing and take any questions. <laughs>